Yeah, as Agam mentioned, my name is Hussein, and I'm going to be talking today about performance, empathy. Now, empathy is a term we commonly use to describe the ability to understand and share the feelings of another individual or a group. I like to think of the term performance empathy to be the same thing, but for the performance concerns and issues of a particular site. To sort of explain why I thought it would be a good topic for a talk, I need to first describe a bit more about myself. I work as an advocate for the web team at Google. Now, developer advocates in many different companies usually act as sort of a bridge between a specific engineering community and the specific engineering team and the developer community. But being an advocate for the web team means that it's my job to make sure the web gets better and better. I focus on speed and performance. So a lot of advocates, we sometimes give advice that can seem a little overwhelming. I don't know why my clicker feels weird. There you go. But in all seriousness, why are so many performance advocates so fascinated about what many people do with their own tool chains? Why are we so focused on whether it will improve performance or not? Why do we care about performance that much to begin with? Is it really that much of a problem? To help us answer this question, let's take a look at this example of a site. It's an entirely client-side rendered site that ships about a megabyte of render blocking JavaScript. And when I say client-side rendered, this means that the initial request only contains a shell of an HTML document. Only after, the user, only after the JavaScript bundle finishes executing, the user gets to see any real content. Now, in case you weren't counting, the amount of time it took for this app to finish loading was about 19 seconds. 19 seconds isn't fast by any means. So we know that one megabyte of JavaScript can seem like a lot to ship down to browsers, how much are we generally shipping? If we take a look at HTTP Archive, we can see that the median amount of JavaScript that we're sending down the wire is about 350 kilobytes. And this is from mobile web pages. The reason why this is such a big deal is because there's a lot of websites currently living in the web that are either entirely static or have little to no interactivity at all. So I thought it would be interesting to dive in a little deeper and see how much sites that use a particular framework are shipping in terms of JavaScript. And I did it with three frameworks to begin with, Angular, React, and Vue. And the reason why I chose these three is because they're the most popular client-side frameworks that we use today to build out our UIs. What I found out was after querying over 250,000 origins, about 50% of them ship over a megabyte of JavaScript. Now, each of these origins either use one or more of these frameworks. There's a lot of reasons why this might be the case, but it does show that we are shipping a lot of JavaScript if we're not entirely careful. Now, what I want to do now is take a step back and talk about how I began this presentation. You see, every single talk I've ever given before today has always followed the exact same format. I begin with a word of caution and talk about how performance is a pretty big problem. I then move on to showing some stats and some numbers to back up my claim. And I do this to convey how much of a problem this actually is. And then the rest of my talks usually follow the same sort of, same sort of pattern where I talk about different tips, different techniques that you should be applying to make sure your site stays as small as possible and as fast as possible. But for this talk, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. I'm going to talk about what we can do as advocates and what we can do better to reach the community better, as well as how we can all work together to try to think of different ways to make sure performance is a win for everybody. 
Going back to that example of a site that we just talked about. Here I mentioned that at the very end I mentioned that we're running this on a mobile device and on a slow 3G connection. The reason why I mention this, a lot of people who trace performance, they try to talk about specific user conditions that might not be the same as yours when you build your application. And we do this because depending on the user's device, depending on the user's network type, they can experience your site a lot slower than you think. And there's more. We sometimes talk about how your users might experience your site if they're completely offline, or if they have a flaky network connection, or maybe they have a weaker device, or maybe they're on mobile, so forth and so on. Although these, it is important to talk about all these scenarios and try to capture different conditions your users might be in, the thing I want to make sure I mention is that you know your users better than anyone else. You definitely know your users better than any advocate that stands on stage telling you how well your site performs under a certain condition. But with that being said, one thing that I also want to mention is the fact that nobody prioritizes performance over anything. If you think about it, when you're trying to build a site, the very first thing you're thinking about usually isn't performance. Most people are like this. But if you also think about it, why should someone make it the very top thing they think about? Let's talk about some scenarios to try and explain what I mean here. Say you wake up one Monday morning and you have an amazing idea. You've thought about a product that you want to sell on a website, or maybe you want to provide a specific type of service. So you're excited, and the next thing you naturally do is you try to find out how to build it. You spend a little time researching the tools, the tips, the tricks that you need. Maybe you're building wireframes, maybe you're building graphics, so forth and so on. But only after that, you actually start, you actually start building. And at this point, throughout this initial process, nobody really thinks about performance. The, one, the thing that you're actually most likely thinking about is the fact that you want to build a site that loads and does exactly what you expect it to do, but build it with as minimal effort and as fast as possible. A second possible scenario could be the fact that you join a brand new team as a developer. Say you're the late, the newest developer on a brand new company or a brand new team, and when you get assigned your first ticket, you're most likely going to try and familiarize yourself with the code base. You're going to spend a little time trying to know where your components live, where the utilities live, how your unit tests work, so forth and so on. And only after that, while you're doing that, you start building and working on your first feature. Maybe it's a small feature you're adding on a page. Maybe it's a small bug that you're working on. But again, also when you're in these shoes, you're not really thinking about performance. You're not thinking about, OK, I need to make sure what I'm building doesn't really degrade the performance of my site. No, when this is the first thing you're doing, you're most likely trying to check every single box that's assigned to you. And it's highly unlikely performance is on that list. So the way I like to think about awareness and performance in general and how people are aware of the performance implication of the site, I try to think of it as in some sort of scale. For example, let's say you're building something for the first time or you're building something for the upteenth time, but you're learning a brand new tool. What you're going to be doing at this point is you're going to try to see how this tool works. Does it do what you expect it to do? You're going to learn this API, learn if it is it's easy to plug into your site. But at this point, it's highly unlikely you're thinking of how badly it's going to affect performance. No, you're most likely thinking, how easy, it, how easy is it for me to use? Let's say you spend some more time with it, and after a while, you end up launching your first website with it. Now you have a better idea of how it works in development mode and how it works in production mode. So now you have a much better feeling of whether it really is affecting performance or not. But you still might be slightly unsure of what you need to do about it. But the more and more you use this tool and the more websites you build with it, the more familiar you are with how it affects the speed and reliability of your site. But with that being said, nobody is more aware with the fact that they need to work on performance than those that actually know they have issues. If a significant percent of your user base tells you that we can't access your site because it's too slow, you're most likely going to try and prioritize it as soon as possible. And this is what I mean by performance being an afterthought. But maybe there are ways out there for performance not to be something we only think of when it's too late. 
throughout this talk, I've sort of had this dichotomy between two different user groups. One being performance advocates, like myself, and one being a normal developer working in a team, working on a regular code base. Now, advocates, I think we all agree on the fact that there are way too many slow sites. And the reason why I think this, this is true is because we have our job because a lot of the sites out there aren't as fast as they should be. If every user accessed a website and felt like it was fast as it needed to be, we wouldn't need to be doing what we do every day. But there's another misconception or another thought that sometimes gets misconstrued that seems kind of weird. And it's the idea that developers are sloppy when they ship slow experiences. And I've seen this sentiment time to time and I, and I can't stand it. Because if a developer is working on a website and it happens to be too slow, it's usually one of three reasons. One, they, know, they don't know it's too slow for their users. Two, they know it's too slow for some of their users, but they don't know how to fix it or they haven't prioritized that yet. And three, they know it's too slow and they're actively working to fix. Speed, again, is always relative. And having an advocate tell you that you're not focusing on something very important to them isn't always the best approach. Now, on the other side of the coin, when we talk about a developer, when you're building a website, you're most likely going to agree that you have a million things you can work on. Performance is just one of them. But there's also another weird thought that I also see sometimes floating around, and it's the idea that advocates, or performance advocates specifically, are out of touch. And the reason why some people might think this is because of the fact that many performance advocates will build small sample apps and sh show you how to optimize, but some people feel like it's not as easy to try to do it with a massive code base and a massive team where code is being checked in everywhere. The reason why I sort of want to squash this thought is because advocates have been in your shoes. We are developers. We've worked with teams. We understand that there's more concerns to a site than there is just performance. So instead of having this back and forth between small weird opinions and small, small thoughts, I think it's safe to say that we all agree towards one common goal. We all want the web to be faster for everyone. So the big question is, how can we make sure we can fix the performance, bar, the performance problem better? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about a few ways we're trying to explore as advocates that are changing sort of how we think about making things better for our developers. The very first is making sure everybody has better defaults. And what I mean by default is the idea that let's say you're building something with a certain tool. If, for, if it always have, gives you a better starting point, you'll most likely always have more wiggle room and more room to play with where it'll take you longer to reach a threshold or performance ends up being slow. And in terms of framework level, a lot of frameworks are looking into this already. React has already been looking into trying to improve React DOM and make its bundle size smaller. And they're doing this through a few different ways, one of them being simplifying its event system. With Vue and Vue 3, they're aiming to reduce memory consumption and cut down its initial bundle size by making things more tree shakeable where they can. And the Angular team is looking into building this brand new rendering engine called Ivy. And with it, they're already exploring ways to cut down its initial bundle size and also looking at ways of maybe progressively hydrating experiences when you have server rendered architectures. React and Suspense is also doing the same thing. And then there's meta frameworks, things like Next.js and Nux.js that build on top of frameworks like React and Vue that allow you to continue to do what you most likely want to do all the time, write and build your components. There are things we tell people to do quite often. You should be code splitting. You should be server rendering where you can. And these meta frameworks try to take it, the, take it out of the hands of the developer. We're already working with Next.js to try to see if we could do things even better and even have smaller bundle sizes and make sure users get the best experience whenever they can. When we talk about defaults, another way to think about it too is also the default APIs or the out-of-the-box APIs that the browser provides. It would be a lot easier if we didn't have to leverage third-party libraries or write scripts ourselves when we try to optimize things that the browser can probably do already. An example of this is the lazy loading attribute. Now, if anybody here has actually built something with a lot of images, you most likely realize that having a lot of images load at once can affect performance. 
So people have become quite used to either pulling in a third-party library or writing their own custom script that takes advantage of the Intersection Observer API or scroll event listeners to only load images as the user scrolls close enough to them. The loading attribute is something that's going to be rolled out to Chrome pretty soon. And by using it with any image tag or iframe tag, it'll automatically lazy load images after it reaches a certain distance threshold from the bottom of the viewport. Think about the wins this can make to any developer. Think about the many developers that don't either know how to build their own lazy loading script or don't even know if, that's a, if there's such a thing. But once they realize there's a simple loading attribute they can add, it will make things a lot simpler for everybody. Another example of an API that is also going to make, can make things easier is the Virtual Scholar API that's also being worked on right now. And if you've ever built anything with a very, any built site with a, long, a very long table or very large list, you've also, also realized that having all those DOM nodes populate at once can affect rendering performance. And the idea behind list virtualization or virtual scrolling is to make sure that only the nodes or only the, the items on the list that the user can see is populated to the DOM. And as the user scrolls down, those DOM nodes get recycled with newer DOM nodes. A lot of frameworks like React, like Angular, have third-party libraries that allow you to virtualize lists. But having a baked-in API can mean you can do this without relying on any of them at all. They're also looking for things that, can, that a lot of these libraries don't even take into account just yet. For example, accessibility concerns, or the find on page feature, or how could SEO crawl your page, or how could a crawler crawl your page and detect things that are not rendered to the DOM just yet. Another very important thing that we also realize is, in general, we need better guardrails for all developers. We've noticed a pattern where we tell people to optimize. And a lot of teams will go ahead and they'll start doing so. But after a certain period of time, feature creeps, scope creeps in, new features are being added, new code is being shipped, and they regress either to their initial state or to a state worse than they were prior. So the idea behind guardrails is what if you had something that made sure everybody stayed accountable and made sure everybody stayed on a narrow path? One such example of a guardrail is a performance budget. And the idea behind a performance budget is it's a budget for a certain performance metric that you make sure your app never exceeds. There's many tools out there that can allow you to add performance budgets. One such example that was recently launched was something called Light Wallet. Now, Lighthouse is an open source tool built by the Chrome team that allows you to audit how well your web page is doing and allows you to test it along a few horizontals. It's accessibility, it's SEO, it's performance, and so on. A lot of developers already use Lighthouse every day in their tooling workflow. And the idea behind LightWallet is what if you can just specify a single JSON file to add performance budgets into it. So you can specify different resource types, define the budget that they should never exceed, as well as define third party or all requests and make sure the number of requests never exceeds a certain value. The third, the third most important point, and I think this is something that actually resonates me, with me quite well, is the fact that we need to meet developers where they are. Now, as advocates, if we're telling developers that they need to change their entire workflow or the tools that they're using isn't going to work and they have to swap it out for another, we're not going to go very far. And it's something I've seen more and more of right now. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to improve the fact that whatever tool you decide to use, whatever framework you decide to use, whatever library you decide to use, what if we can always make sure that tool stays as performant as it possibly can? In terms of how we're trying to do this, one way is through tooling. And there's a feature called Stack Packs. This also extends Lighthouse, but in a slightly different way. The idea behind Stack Packs is it actually allows Lighthouse to detect what tools are being run in your page. And then it will also surface additional recommendations, more specific to that tool. For example, let's say you're using WordPress to build a site, and you're trying to figure out how to properly size your images. You can read a highly generalized advice that will apply to anyone, but you'll also see advice that's more specific to you. You'll figure out how to do it using the WordPress platform. Now, with the idea of stack packs, we're trying to roll this out to many JavaScript frameworks and other CMS tools to make it easier for as many developers as possible. WordPress is the only one that's actually supported right now. 
documentation is always going to be a big deal. And it's going to be a big deal for a while. Now, in Google and in the Chrome team, we have a lot of documentation that's very high level, very generalized, and they work for as many developers as they possibly can. But one thing we're also trying to do is we're trying to roll out framework-specific guidance. Web.dev is a new documentation site that we have that's more interactive and more specific to the user, and we recently launched a whole section on frameworks. The idea, is we're not, the idea here is we're not trying to teach you how to use a tool like React. We're trying to show you how you can make your React app as fast as possible using inbuilt React APIs and third-party libraries in the React ecosystem. We plan on having more like Angular Vue and other frameworks in the future. One other thing the Chrome team has also been doing is in terms of monetary support. Malta and Nicole announced this at CDS, and they mentioned something called a framework fund. And the idea here is there's a lot of people working in open source. There's a lot of developers working in open source. And one thing that they focus on is performance and how performant those tools are. But what if we could support them in more than one way, more than one, way than one so that they can continue to try and improve performance of their tools so every user that decides to use them will automatically get better defaults, better guardrails, and more. So when it comes to fixing the performance problem, I think as advocates, we're currently doing it in two sort of ways. One being what I call external support. We write blogs to tell you how to do things. We build third-party libraries that you can plug into your site. We give talks at a place like JSConf and tell you what you need to do to improve the speed of your site. And then there's the internal side of things. How about the tools that you're using get better by default? What if they get better at a starting point? What if they have better budgets? What if they have better, gu better guidance and better warnings? As of now, I currently feel like we're more so on the external side. And that's fine. We'll continue to do that as long as we can reach more developers as we possibly can. But what I'd like to see in the next few years is a shift in the other direction. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have to tell developers what to do if every tool they're using already does it automatically. I hope you enjoyed this talk as much as I enjoyed giving it. Thank you. <laughs>